So hello and welcome to the Money Magpie webinar, how to invest in a recession. You could call it how to invest during stagflation, which is what we seem to have right now. Um, and to help us work out what the heck to do with our money right now in these very confusing, turbulent times, I have four experts that I love to have on my webinars and podcasts because I know that they know what they're talking about. We have Justin Urquhart Stewart. Justin, do say hi. Good morning or good afternoon or wherever you are. Hello. Oh, lovely Pusscat as well. How nice. Now, Justin um, is founder of, formerly of Barclays Stockbrokers, which is where I first met him, um, but founder of Seven Investments, which could easily be in your pension fund, your, any of your investments right now. And uh, currently regionally, which helps regional businesses. Um, we also have man, international man of mystery, as he stars himself, Tim Price. Say hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hello. <laughs> well done. As you can see, uh, Tim, oh. Tim can't afford a, a, a camera. Um, that's that's value but, investing for you. Value is yes. what value does. <laughs> exactly, value investing. And he's a co-founder of Price Value Partners, which are wealth managers. Um, and we also have Nick Hubble. Say hi, Nick. Hello, everyone. Yeah. The babies are asleep, so I can't show you anyone. And my background's not as exciting as Tim's either. <laughs> exactly. Similar, almost international man of mystery. You've got the international bit. Um, to, uh, Nick is actually speaking to us from Australia. What time is it in Australia, Nick? 10 p.m. Absolutely. And as you say, the kids are in bed, so you can play with us, which is which is fantastic. Thank you. And Nick runs the Fortune and Freedom newsletter, which is an excellent free newsletter all about investing and the economy and all sorts of, of other stuff um, beside. Um, I get it and I enjoy it. He also writes for some of the other um, South Bank Investments newsletters. And last but not least, and I've lifted him to the last because he is our lovely sponsor. We love you. Absolutely. Sam North, give us a wave. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Yeah. And Sam is from eToro. Um, and of course, Sam actually gives a lot of talks on how to invest, starting to invest, investing in all sorts of things like, you know, shares, CFDs, crypto. He can talk about all sorts of things like that. So as I said, I'm going to start off with a few questions, but it's your opportunity to ask your questions. We want your questions. No question is too dumb. Seriously, this is a safe space um, and it's highly likely that any question that you think is dumb is really not dumb. And everybody else, or at least half the rest of them were thinking that as well. I'm thinking, oh, thank goodness they've asked that one. So we want your questions either in the chat or in, uh, you know, just raise your hand and um, and give a uh, give us a question. Hi, everyone from Andrew Bevan. Hello, Andrew. Good, good to have you here as well, because I know Andrew gives us very good questions as well. Now I'm going to start it off with the easy peasy question, uh, and I'll, again, I'll I'll start I'll start with Nick Hubble with this one. Let's start with our international one. Nick, what the heck is happening? Absolutely everything at the same time. And that's not that unusual for financial markets and economics and politics because it's so interconnected. Uh, it's, there's so many dominoes lying about all over the place and, and you know, one of them falls somewhere and all of a sudden there's a chain reaction. So, you know, it, it's not a big surprise that when, when it, you know, there's a little bit of chaos, all of a sudden it magnifies itself. The problem really is the amount of things that were just waiting to go wrong, the amount of potential problems that we had that we're just waiting for that initial domino to, to, to tip over. So um, I'll move to you, Sam. Uh, what, you know, again, what the heck is happening? What do you feel is happening in particularly in the stock market? Yeah, yeah. Like Nick was saying, it's like everything that can go wrong <laughs> has gone wrong at the moment. You, you've got inflation at multi-decade highs. Uh, you've got the supply chain issues that were, that were prevalent at the beginning of the year. You've got all these interest rate hikes that are happening pretty much everywhere. Uh, you've still got in places like China, you know, the zero sort of COVID policy. So a lot of lockdowns there. You've got global growth, you know, slowing down and, and the geopolitical tensions. You add that all together, no market's really going to like that. So, you know, I mean, September, we've just finished that. I mean, historically, the worst month of the year for the stock market. 
and it, you know it didn't disappoint this this uh, this month either. Really, sort of poor month uh, in the stock market. A lot of them closed on Friday near multi-year lows, or at least the low of this year. So yeah, markets have have, have been shaky. Uh, there was a little bit of a recovery June July that didn't last too long, and uh, yeah, it it feels like twenty twenty two uh is is been you know one of those years where it just drags on and on and on with the bad news so fingers crossed it can you know it can recover into the back end of the year but i don't know how many people are too hopeful right now true um justin when it comes to sorting things out do you think there's there's any hope that our government can do something to to improve the situation because it feels like there's a whole load of elements outside of their control here um do they have any hope of of getting putting things upright again this government's got any hope of doing anything at all um for the past few weeks we had uh, queen liz sadly dying uh, and that actually showed the great thing that Britain's so good at, which is pageantry power. Um, we're really very good. If we, if we could pack, package that up and sell it, we'll be very wealthy. Uh, but then, of course, we have this uh, this Tory leadership uh, 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 hustings lasting over over a month uh, at a time when actually the global economy needs some direct leadership. Because one word that runs the economy and is with it all the investments is confidence. If you haven't any confidence, nothing happens at all. Um, and so it's really going to be very difficult. Frankly, when I look around, not just the British politicians, frankly, the global ones, none of them actually stand out as being fantastic leaders, but that's just cop out. Uh, the answer is though, the, the, uh, our politicians in Britain, no matter what you think of them, have got to try and getting their, their act together. If not, we will continue to see what happened last week, which is not so much the equity markets, that's not so important, it's the bond market. Bond market tell you, is telling you what's happening, and that's not good news. True. Yeah. And, and the bond market. Now, Tim, this is this is one of your themes and has been, I know, for, for the last few years that the bond market it looks look it keeps looking like it's a, it's staggering, staggering on and could crash at any moment. How do you feel about the bond market right now? It, it already crashed to a certain extent. So Justin's right. It's, it's the story that the epicenter is, is bond. A friend at uh, Ruffa uh, Investments sent me some stats. I think I may have come across them on uh, LinkedIn earlier, that there was um, there's a 50 year index linked bond, index linked guilt, UK government bond. And uh, in the in the immediate aftermath of the quasi Kwarteng mini budget, it fell by over 50% in price. Now that's a UK, I'll just repeat that, that's a UK government bond in the space of roughly 48 hours, lost over half of its value. Now I, I suspect that that's never happened before in history, and it may never recur in history either, but so the bond market is the epicenter of this. And as you say, we've been majoring on this for some time now. So this is not a surprise. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. We recently gave a presentation to clients in London and Jersey. And the very first slide was basically a chart of interest rates going back 5,000 years. This is the bottom line. Interest rates set, not least in the bond market, are rising from their lowest levels in recorded history. And if we just take the last 40 years, they're rising from very low levels. So if you were an investor back in the early 80s, uh, you then experienced lower interest rates, um, lower inflation, higher stock markets, higher bond markets, higher property markets. All of that is now going into reverse. So now that interest rates are, uh, are rising quite steeply in line with inflation, um, you can expect what has worked recently not to necessarily work in the future. So in fact, not to put too fine a point on it, all bets are off now. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it, I'm laughing because, you know, you if you don't laugh, you have to cry. Um, so when you say all bets are off, um, I mean, we, we did hear that the, the government had to, or Bank of England, had to shore up the bond market. And they were saying, oh, no, pensions market. They were saying it was because pensions companies were investing in sort of slightly dodgy um, stuff. But was it actually... The bond market was well, the, that... the, the, the bottom line was basically that pension funds were using things called LDI, liability driven investments, to gear up their portfolios. So you have the perfect storm whenever someone who's basically uh, acutely vulnerable to one particular price, when that price goes against you, you become a forced seller. And this is identical to what happened in the 87 crash in the US when you had program, I think it was called program selling or program insurance, but basically you had. 
you had people who, who were linked to the derivatives market. And what that meant was that the, the further the market went down, the more of their portfolios they needed to sell. So this is a recurrent theme throughout finance, that whenever people use borrowed money, it goes wrong eventually. And that, well, I think that's all that's happened in the bond market now. I mean, the bond market was under pressure anyway, not least because of inflation. And we knew that the Bank of England, until the, the mini budget, was due to uh, start so-called quantitative tightening. In other words, withdraw support for the market. Now it's gone back into quantitative easing again. So if, if the government wanted to make itself look like, a, like a, um, a, a clown running over a minefield, it's done a pretty good job of it. So when it comes to you know, dealing with it, uh, you know, as individuals, as actual individual investors, where on earth do we start now? I mean, as Tim says, all bets are off. Nick, what do you think that individual investors need to think about right now? I've recently been writing about what happens when central banks are starting to tighten to try and bring down inflation that's already gotten out of control. And you also have stagflation. And there's not many periods in history that has that combination, the high inflation, the tightening monetary policy uh, and the recession. And the big lesson from those periods is probably to own quite a bit of gold. Gold is an opt out asset. Uh, you don't rely on anyone else when you own gold and gold preserves your purchasing power. All other financial assets rely on someone else to do their job properly, which is it's, it's not a good assumption at the moment because people are not doing their jobs properly. I mean, these it's a pension fund. It's a pension fund that got into trouble. You know, it's not a bank or an investment bank or, or overly leveraged, whatever it is. Um, it, it's supposed to be quite safe and boring. So I think that that's one option, gold. But the real threat here is that everything was inflated. Um, so much that everything's just starting to normalize now. It's been a, an unbelievable crash. If you do the maths for the US market, the typical investor and buys you know, the S&P 500 and some bonds, they would have had the worst uh, performance going back to the Great Depression, even beyond the Great Depression adjusted for inflation. So that's because the, the, the asset prices were bid up so much going into this that even just bringing things to much more normal levels it makes for this enormous crash. Right, that's uh, that's a happy thought. And um, now Nick has asked, uh, no, Neil, sorry, Neil has asked, owning gold, what percentage of your pot should be in gold? Very good question. What, what do you think, Nick? Um, the the number that's very commonly bandied about by people like me is about ten percent. I would increase that at the moment, but it depends on what else you invest in, what else your 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 personal financial circumstances. Um, you know, how you're set up, what other investments you have. So for example, if you have gold shares, then you don't want to increase it even more. Um, but yeah, 10% is a good place to start. Uh, very few people will have that. Um, go, sorry, Tim, I know that you, you're big on gold. Um, what what have, would you say for your funds, um, the, the price value partners, um, what percentage have you got in the money metals, not just gold, but the money metals generally? Sure. So, so we make a special case for the, for the money, as you say, the monetary metals, gold and silver, because they've always been money good throughout all of you know, recorded history. What individuals should own is, is, is entirely a personal decision. So it's up to the individual investor. What we do, and this is very much with a view to capital preservation, we allocate typically between 20 and 40 percent to bullion and to commodities related investments so for us it's it's a pretty high proportion of the overall pot but that's predominantly through equity not through the bullion asset itself ah oh, interesting so when you say through equity you're you're talking about actual gold mining companies are correct you? yeah mm. correct gold mining companies silver mining companies royalty streaming companies and other commodities listed businesses the one characteristic or the two characteristics they should all have though are that they're highly cash generative already and they have little or no debt so that ho hopefully helps us avoid value traps yeah, that's a good point. And actually, Andrew Bevan says, how much silver? I mean, I suppose the answer is the same, depends on the person, but it, it is a lot more volatile than gold, isn't it, Tim? Yeah, it is. But that's because it's not least because it's such a lower price. So you can buy so much more of it with the same amount of capital. But again, uh, central banks buy gold, probably less so or probably not at all silver. So silver is, if you like, the poor man's gold. But I think there's merit in both. Um, gold is almost entirely a sort of alternative monetary good, and it's also a form for jewellery. Silver has industrial application, so it's slightly more industrially volatile. But we like we like to own both. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Justin, um, I've got a question here from Sia K, who says, "Where should a novice investor start?" So it's, it's a nice broad question, which a lot of people are wondering. 
Yeah, well, one of the things you have to do, we wish we don't do really, is actually teach people finance, not about investment, just finance. So we have uh, kids leaving school, leaving university with a whole pile of debt, not even very cheap debt either, courtesy of the government. Um, and then they're expected actually then to sort out a, a, a large debt, go get a mortgage, oh, by the way, save for a pension, and no one's got a clue actually what they should be doing, let alone how it actually works. And so, first of all, a novice investor needs to be educated without being patronising about it. One of the great ways actually you can do that, just to learn about investing, and admittedly, this is, it's, it's relatively narrow, but it gets people an idea of understanding about risk, liquidity, and research. And then it's a very old fashioned thing, setting up investment clubs, where you actually groups of people gathering together, putting in 20, 30, 40 pounds a month, wherever it happens to be, and learning almost how to make mistakes on the basis that you buy a company it goes horribly wrong because you lost 50 quid. Whereas if you're buying actually seriously for yourself and you're going to put £2,000, well, you're then dealing with a financial version of horse racing. That's not investing, that's betting. Yeah. So the education as to what to do and how to go about it. Uh, and I think that's very, uh, really very sensible because it's a practical thing. And heaven for fend, you can actually also have some fun as well. Um, <laughs> and some of the clubs I've been to actually said most of the time actually just, uh, they've actually made quite a bit of money over the years. Um, seem to be advanced drinkers as well, but may um, possibly mean in some of the decisions aren't quite as firm as you'd expect. But no, that's what you have to try and do. Now, the good news is, and I have to say, let me uh, mention um, uh, 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 Sam from eToro. There are lots of now sites and places you can go to, and of course, Manny Magpie, to actually learn more about this, get views and opinions, mm -hmm. and learn how things go wrong. Good investment, if you're doing it really, really well, should be actually quite dull. Um, <laughs> because rule one of investing is very simple. Don't lose the sodding stuff. Mm -hmm. Rule two, refer to rule one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and just over time. Um, and so actually one of the most important things you can learn about investing, which uh, sounds again very dull, is the power of compounding. Mm -hmm. Deeply tedious things like uh, dividends coming through and companies are still paying dividends. Some have to stop it, but over a longer term, those that actually set up to provide dividends on a regular basis, we know who they are, will actually then give you that benefit of compounding. And it's only of any benefit to you if you're investing for the longer term. So equity investment, in my view, is not a one or two year thing, unless you want to have a bet, nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's no, it's five to seven, maybe longer. And giving your, br your broad breadth of equities and also other asset classes, there are lots of things you can invest in, um, to make sure that you're not actually um, investing on a pogo stick, but actually you've got a whole series of legs you can stand on. And if one or two of them drop off, well, you might have a limp for a while, but at least you haven't fallen over. Yeah, absolutely. Spread your bets. Yes, Sam, it'd be great to hear from you because I know eToro kind of specializes um, in novice investors. Obviously, you've got a lot of people who know what they're doing as well, but you've got a lot of help there for the, the novice, don't you? Yeah, that's right. I, I, we've, we've got um, something called the eToro Academy where there's, you know, videos, podcast guides, everything um, that someone could want. And then we do regular webinars as well, similar to this, where we, we we speak about what's going on in the markets, what could drive price in the short term, the long term and, and, and so on. And uh, I was actually uh, I was doing a one to one session with a, a Premier League footballer, funny enough, on, mm -hmm. on Friday, who was he, he's 25 years old. I'm not going to say who he is, but um, he he was he was wanting to get you know proper serious about his investing. He realized it's a short career. I want to look after my money. You know, you've probably all heard the stat: sixty percent of footballers go bankrupt within like three or four years, which is absolutely wow. mental considering the money yeah. that they generate in that sort of 15, 20 year period. So he really wants to get his head down and and sort of find out as much about it as he can. And, and we were just sort of saying, similar to what Justin was saying, make make investing boring, make it just incredibly dull. I think when people try to get these mega mega returns quickly that's when it can unravel yeah. and go wrong so we were talking about the importance of you know being diversified doing it regularly rather than trying to time the market if you can time the market fantastic the chance of someone doing that initially is, is going to be incredibly hard so we were just talking about being diversified regularly investing and and, and having a sort of a longer term view on things because statistically the odds are in your favor doing it that way when you try time it and be very uh, particular about it that's when things can unravel 
So it, it is really getting that knowledge, as you say, Money Magpie has lots, eToro has lots. Um, happily, there is quite a lot on, online now. You can just sort of read a bit here and there um, and then be boring with it. Just regular, I think, you know, it's like, it's like bowel movements. It's a good idea to be regular with your little <laughs> bits of money every, every month if you can. Set up a standing or a few standing orders. Um, Susan asks, um, how, does, um, how do you, does a novice start to buy gold? Uh, who can you trust? Good question. Um, Tim, you buy gold for yourself sometimes, don't you? I mean, actual physical gold, because there are various different ways of, of buying gold, of course. Where, what do you suggest? Well, I can tell you that how I started. So I started buying gold through a company called ATS Bullion, which is mm -hmm. um, um, a bullion dealer right next to the Savoy Hotel, just off the Strand. Um, but there's multiple places for this. So there's, there's, no, there's no shortage of choice. Companies like Gold Money or Bullion Vault are all credible um, players in this space, and I'm sure you'll also be able to identify several yourself. So, my 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 suggestion would be: you start off owning the physical asset. You want to own the physical asset, mm -hmm. and then when you're sort of comfortable with the whole premise, maybe you then want to start consider investing either in a, a gold equities fund, or if you have the appetite and the, and the curiosity and the, the risk tolerance, maybe start to look at a few large cap gold miners. Um, there's a, a special type of gold and silver company called a streaming or royalty company. And these are companies that don't explore the gold. They simply do deals with um, non-monetary um, metal miners, like say um, uh, Antofagasta or whoever it might be. Um, and when they come across gold as a, as a byproduct of, let's say, a copper mine, um, the royalty or streaming companies will come in and say, well, we'll take the gold off your hands We'll agree a price. We'll we'll agree to to buy that in, you know, for, for whatever period, and that ensures them a supply of the physical, but without taking exploration or production risks. So it's a nice halfway house between bullion and a and a full blown mining company. And then again, if you have the risk appetite, go for go for large cap miners, go for small cap miners, each of whom has different risk and return attributes. But it's all part of the diversity plan. So that's you're really talking about shares. So you've you've got the actual physical gold that your sovereigns or your little bars. You can you can get really tiny bars bars now from the Royal Mint. I've seen you know seventy nine quid. It's like a sliver pretty much of gold. <clears throat> so the Royal Mint is good as as um, Tim mentions ATS Bully, and you can find them online as well. Or if you're in London or you know coming to London, you could pop down to the Savoy. As he says it's just round the corner from there, um, and um, Tim also mentioned Bullion Vault because Bullion Vault and also the Royal Mint do digital gold. So, you know, you might prefer that. You could have the physical thing in your hand, or then you have to work out where to put it that it's safe, you know. Um, but you could have digital gold through Bullion Vault or, um, as I say, uh, the, the Royal Mint, and they just hold it for you. So you never see it. You buy it, you sell it. You just you don't never see it. Another way, actually, um, something that we are promoting at Money Magpie because um, we like it is a new savings account that invests in gold. And that's called Tally Money. So if you go to tallymoney.com, um, in fact, I'll, I'll write it in the chat um tallymoney.com um you can set up an ordinary savings account and and it comes with a, a a card a payment card with it so you can you can buy coffee with it you can buy a car with it but all the money is invested in gold it doesn't give you interest but it goes up and down with gold so in theory at least it should roughly speaking keep up with inflation you would hope anyway so that's a nice, uh, you know, um, an easier way to do it, uh, perhaps. Oh, we've got lots of questions here. Um, 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 oh, wow. <laughs> I'm just wondering where we are now. Uh, I was thinking to myself, oh, I'm doing quite nicely, so sort of covering this, but we've got all sorts of questions. Um, how does a novice, oh, yes, the buy, yes, that's buy, buying gold. Um, and uh, you, you, oh, I can't read that. Unitanium? Almost, well, no, I don't understand that one. Um, and um, even though bonuses have suffered, so this is from Matthew, even though bonuses, bonds have suffered greatly recently, is it possible that the value of an individual bond can recover under different economic conditions? Or are the losses irrecoverable? Um, what do you think, Justin, about that question? 
Yes, the losses are recoverable, um, but it's going to have to take a change, very significant change in what's happening to interest rates at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, really, with interest rates, we've still been in the emergency rates since the banking crisis. Um, and so that's why I've had these ludicrously low rates. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons central banks wanted to actually put rates up was to actually, there's a recession coming, so I can cut rates. It's quite difficult to cut rates when you're supposed to naught. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they're trying to do is encourage stabilisation. Um, and uh, certainly build it up. Also, mm -hmm. as inflation was creeping into the system, that should be one of the mechanisms you can use to try and control inflation. It does, it's no, not always terribly effective, but the, bank, the central banks don't have many choices. They have only limited number of weapons they can use. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the British government seemed to find itself in a diametrically opposite position, whereas actually the Bank of England was trying to raise rates um, and be able to, to control inflation, Whereas the government was in the position where it was actually trying to make it more inflationary to actually put more. So they're working in opposite, uh, opposite ways to each other. And therefore, it's hardly surprising. International markets turned around and looked at it and said, what on earth are you doing here? I don't want to invest in this. Thank you very much. I like bonds, but I don't like your bonds. Britain's actually always been quite a good. We're a fairly reliable country to invest in. We've never defaulted. Most other countries have defaulted. In one or two American states have as well. Um, so we're not in the position where it's defaulting. It's people saying, am I really that attracted to invest in Britain? Well, yeah, but not at those rates. You're going to have to pay me a lot more to take on that risk. And even an insult when you get the IMF, whose forecasts are generally, what's the technical term, wrong. wrong. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, when they come out with the figures actually saying, criticising uh, the UK, well, remember, most of their work is actually dealing with emerging markets, which sort of implies, well, we're not an emerging market but we're doing a some fantastic impression of maybe a submerging market at the moment, but that's not uh, really, not all is lost. Uh, we can see where the growth is going to be coming from. Um, and we can see, obviously dependent upon all sorts of other political issues, um, that there will be growth there in due course. Half the problem to me is actually getting the politicians out of the way, uh, mm. as what we've seen over the past six weeks, particularly amongst the uh, uh, leadership uh, of, uh, of, the, of the government, a wholesale lack of knowledge and understanding of how things work and really taking a, a view as to how best to actually try and calm things down overall. And having, as we found out a few days ago, a chancellor who on the eve of a budget, OK, not a budget, but you're supposed to be in Perda and actually not telling everybody, sitting down and having drinks with actually the, the, uh, some hedge fund managers who also, by the way, have been supporting Ms. Truss on her campaign. Right. Now, I'm sure they were just talking about the rules of monopoly and maybe playing cards and canasta and things like that. I'm not mentioning what actually might be in the budget, which could be rather worrying and maybe they might want to sell the market short. Well, stone me. Um, that's exactly what did happen. Do I yeah. smell a rat here? No, uh, probably several. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I've got another question actually from, um, I'll point from Andrew Bevan, who says, two out of three places I buy gold um, from are out of stock of silver and gold. Um, Nick, I've heard that, I mean, this is happening. A a anytime I go and buy gold, they're like, oh, yes, we're so busy, we're so busy. And yet, the gold price is nowhere near as high as you would you would expect. What why is why do you think that is, Nick? Yeah, it's an ongoing long story in the in the gold market. It's because the, the gold price is set in the futures market, in the paper market, where investment banks trade it. It's not set in a physical market like most other goods. And because of that, it's possible that the price is suppressed by trading of futures by investment bankers. And there was a big scandal um, and a lot of people um, were, were caught doing this recently. It doesn't necessarily mean that the gold price is suppressed over long periods of time, but the point is that the day-to-day -day movements in the gold price are set in that futures market. Uh, and that then can create a divergence between what's happening on the ground in terms of physical gold. Um, I've often wondered why people don't just get together and, and make, uh, you know, make the most of this by, I guess forming an investment club that buys gold and, and gets it delivered, um, given all of these shortages that everyone tells me about. Yeah, absolutely. I think. <laughs> so it, it does feel like now, I mean, I, I must say, and I should have said this right at the beginning, that nothing uh, said in this webinar should be taken as uh, investment advice, not at all. Um, but this, we're just saying our opinions. And um, yeah, my opinion is that, that gold seems to be cheap. I mean, certainly that must be your opinion, Tim. Yeah, I, I notice on the comments that people are talking about, you know, gold's risen in, in, you know, in some currencies, but not in others. Think about gold, the physical asset, as just an alternative currency. So you can price gold in whatever currency you like. 
the reality is that gold has gone up quite consistently since 2000 in just about every currency. The only the only currency it's meaningfully fallen in this year is the dollar, but the dollar has been preeminent against everything. If you take an annualized view, gold's done really well as an investment for the last 20 years. And I happen to think it, you know, again, personal opinion, I happen to think it's going to do very, very well in the years to come, precisely because the bond market's run out of steam and governments are printing, creating currencies, creating new money like it's going out of fashion, which it is. The beauty of gold in just one form is it's nobody else's liability. That's worth having in a, in a world where currencies are being massively debauched. Yes, yes. Um, Justin, were you waving? Yeah, there's one thing about gold, which is um, I think people should be aware of. You can buy gold via, uh, via an ETF, exchange traded fund or ETC, exchange commodity, um, which is fine. You have to watch the cost on it, but it means it's very easy to trade in and out of that. Um, and so that makes life easier. However, you have to make sure with these ETFs, are they investing in gold, actual gold, or are they, as the useless term, synthetic, which is an excuse to say we're investing in something else which reflects gold, uh, which is what? And then they get a bit hazy as to what the detail is. That is risky, and in my view, you should go nowhere near it. So you know, ETF access is a kind of perfect good way of going about it, uh, but be wary of the construction underneath it and uh, just uh, take, uh, bear in mind that particular risk. The other drawback with gold, of course, yes, it goes up or down. There's no three dimension to it, uh, and nor would you expect it. But, you know, dividends are important uh, to investment portfolios. So gold should be part of it. And I agree with what Nick was saying, 10, 15 percent in nervous times. You still have to have those other asset classes. The one you probably don't want to go near at the moment will be those government got bond markets. Mm -hmm. um, and they have been seriously distorted. But yeah. though, are there other areas we can look at? The problem Britain's got at the moment is there are so many issues working against the economy that actually it could actually, we could lose confidence really very quickly indeed. Mm. Only a couple of months ago, I wouldn't have necessarily been in that position because the way the government's handling things at the moment, it's mm. not getting that confidence. And so the future looks foggy. People mm. like to be able to see what's happening. Normally, I'd be saying, OK, the global economy will recover and therefore we can invest when the market's weak. Well, it will eventually recover. If you don't think it's going to recover, go and buy a case of scotch and go and sit at a cave in Wales um, <laughs> and forget all about it. If you do think it's actually still going to be there in some form, then you don't opt out altogether. You have to look to those areas which have been heavily bombed but still creating cash. Uh, actually in a position where they've got low levels of debt, such companies are around and still have demand, even in um, uh, markets like this. And particularly also, we have to be very careful with smaller companies, very, very risky indeed. But if you know the detail, actually how they operate and what they're trying to do, again, there'd be some good value. But for private investors, as you really understand and know those businesses, um, you have to be very careful. And particularly when you're dealing with overseas ones, for instance, Chinese companies, for example, you know, no company goes bust in China without the party saying so. Mm. Uh, and you start getting hold of a report and accounts from a Chinese uh, company. We used to think Italian ones were uh, bad enough. One for you, one for the tax man, and one for the actual uh, who's running the country. Uh, in China, you could probably double that. And yeah. I'm afraid the quality of the data you're getting is awful. And yeah. if you're in that situation, you stay well away from that. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. Now, we've got a question from Peter. Peter, we can't actually answer this question exactly, but I'm going to give it to, to Sam to talk generally, uh, because you're saying, um, should I pay more money into my Aviva pension, given it has declined by £17,000 since 1st of January 2022? Gosh. Um, Sam, what do, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I think, Peter, you're, you're not going to be alone this year in, in 2022 in, in having a, a pretty tough time. But the good, the good news is, you know, overall, stock markets do go up over time, especially if we just, you know, cross the, the pond to the US. I think it's 70 odd percent of the time it, it, it's going to finish higher. On average, I think it's around 10 percent. So, you know, while we're in this sort of this bear market, this recession, they don't last forever and markets do recover. I think what can be tricky is when people go about it trying to pick individual stocks, for example. So while if we fast forward two, three years, the stock market may well be back at all time highs, you can have some individual stocks that won't. So in that sort of longer term pension diversified equity portfolio, you know, this for some people will be you know, a great opportunity to get in, right? Because you're looking at markets that are 20, 35% down, 
that recovery will be will be great so look trying to time it perfectly is going to be tough but that said what follows uh, a, a bear market every time we've seen the history is a bull market which lasts three four times as long uh, i think recessions on average um you know i think there's been 11 since world war ii they are lasting less time than 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 before thanks to central banks um in the way that they sort of deal with things i know they're not everyone's best friend right now central banks <laughs> but um i i do do think you know things can start to look a little bit better in the months to come i don't necessarily think it's going to be a good winter at all for for prices still but you know you're if you think about it long long term you're you're buying at a discount now but again it's still in in my view certainly the way that i would be doing it is monthly looking to get in trying to time it is is going to be hard mm -hmm. and if you do just you know buy at one price you you you're tied to that now look if you had a crystal ball and you went back to march 2020 and you decided to buy then you're still laughing now you know that pandemic low mm -hmm. but you know, again, at the time there, you had some very, very, very smart people saying this market's still going to go lower. So if they don't know, uh, you know, to the exact point, we're not going to either. So I think it's a case of, yeah, diversifying, you know, not risking what you can't afford to lose, but still having that longer term view of that that stock market is on your side. Nick, can That's I? Yes. Hello. So, there's a lovely line there when you're when you're fantastic. Sorry. Um, oh. Carry on. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm um, I'm I'm not sure who was speaking there. So uh, uh, do speak, Justin. <laughs> oh, it's just a lovely old line with this. It's uh, you know we talk about time in the market. It was always timing the market, uh, which is almost impossible. It's time in the market. You got to stay there for the longer term to be able to get all of that and really make sure you get that that value uh, because otherwise it's uh, you are just into betting and that's a, a significant difference uh, overall. Sorry. Karen. Absolutely. Um, Nick, I was going to ask you, what, what do you, because, you know, th this, this experience um, here of losing, I, I mean, I don't know what percentage it is, but 17k feels like a lot um, in, in one year. Um, are you seeing most funds going down at the moment? You know, has, has it been a downer for pretty much all the pension funds and investment funds as far as you've seen? Yeah, because they rely on, on bonds going up when their stocks go down, which hasn't happened, which makes it especially dangerous. Um, and th there's another issue here, though, despite agreeing with the, the conclusions that Sam reached said that, you know, when the stocks fall, that's when you should be buying. Uh, and that's almost a sign that, that that's that's the opportunity. And personally, I would only buy after a crash. That's the only time I'm going to be bothering to get into the stock market. The, the issue is that during periods when we have stagflation and central banks are tightening monetary policy to try and get that stagflation under control, the market can go down really, really, really badly. So in uh, for, for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the US stock market index that goes right back to before World War I, for example, that the 1982 bottom in the Dow Jones Industrial Average was the same level inflation adjusted as before World War I, <laughs> right? So that, that you know, time in the market didn't help you then. Mm. Now, the, the, the thing is after that, we had one of the best bull markets in history. The question is how low does it go? And this particular time period is especially dangerous because of that combination of a bad economy, inflation and tightening monetary policy. It's extremely unlikely that central bankers will be able to go back to inflating a new bubble uh, and pushing stock markets up again because of the inflation that we've got. That's what makes this so dangerous. And that's what makes the old, the old investment rules of time in the market and things like that a bit more dangerous than they usually would be. Oh, interesting. Oh, we've got uh, another question also from Adrian, who says, can I ask, hasn't gold, ha haven't gold prices already rocketed? So is it too late to buy gold? Um, not in my opinion. Uh, Tim, what do you think? Is it too late? No, not by long chalk, in my view. The, oh. the issue here is, it, as I say, you should look at gold as an alternative currency, the one that's not anybody's <laughs> liability, that doesn't have any counterparty risk. Um, so a question we often get from clients is, when do we take profits in gold? And the answer is, it, well, that's looking, looking at the markets with the wrong end of a telescope. What people should be asking is, it's not what's, what's gold worth in dollars, but rather what's the dollar worth? In extreme, is the dollar's not worth anything. Now, we may yet to see the dollar not worth anything in our own lifetimes. But the issue is, we will sell, take profits in gold when the circumstances that, that enabled us or inspired us to buy it have changed. 
We own gold for clients in large part because the world is drowning in debt and that debt is being inflated away. When the debt predicament is resolved, we'll look maybe to shift into other things. But for, as things stand, you know, the thing about commodities, which gold undoubtedly is, commodities prices can move far further more quickly than anyone anticipates. So I, in my view, we are only at the, the start of a multi-year bull market for commodities generally and for gold in particular. So we're not phased by very short-term underperformance. So what, what you're, you're saying is it's not just gold, silver. We're, we're talking oil, steel. Yeah, we just call them real assets. So we, we allocate typically up 40 to 50% of client portfolios into equity interest relating to re the real asset you know, sector. Mm -hmm. And given the, the amazing thing now is that you would think that in a high inflation world, people should be bidding these things up to astronomical levels. The reality is that there's a ratio that we, we, we talk about with clients pretty much all the time now. The Bloomberg Commodities Index versus the S&P 500, the broad US stock market, is at its cheapest level for 50 years. This is probably the most um, compelling investment opportunity I've seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So uh, favoring real assets right now over paper ones seems to me to make all the sense in the world. Justin, are there, is there such a thing as um, a commodities fund? You know, because uh, Tim is talking about individual companies, individual shares, which is which is great, I think, for a professional investor. But for someone like me, someone like you know, um, the, everybody else in in the audience, it's it's easier and safer quite often to to just invest in a fund. What what would you suggest in terms of to to make the most of what Tim is saying about the commodities? Well, there's two. Yes, the, the first part of the question is yes, there are lots of commodity funds, uh, but look very carefully, first of all, at what uh, at what's inside them and how they're run. Uh, first of all, you can actually look at uh, the structure in terms of actually the, what the price is and what its past performance has been like, and what its past performance has been like uh, actually after costs as well, and to also compare that with inflation to give you a decent measure as to the real value there. Also, you can actually have uh, some which are passive investments, whereby they are just buying effectively the price or the index or price of individual commodities, and they follow that up and down. Um, now, that means, of course, it's completely dumb, doesn't require any human being in it. It just merely operates like that. So if you think generally commodities are mostly going to go up, it's quite a good way of doing it. Um, you can do that with companies as well. If you can't pick individual companies, then you can buy a sector or the index and the same applies to commodities. Mm. However, with commodities, because you've actually got you know, specialists in particular areas, you can then use that specialist knowledge uh, and see if they are actually able to use that to get better returns over years. So their particular fund managers will have experience in particular commodities. And again, you can go in, see the individuals or groups who have managed it, what their past record has been over quite a period of time. And if they can pass a record which is actually showing real returns, um, not necessarily the same every single year, because that would imply uh, something's going on. You'd end up some running a Ponzi scheme behind it, not unknown. Um, and so some investigation in there. So the answer is the private investor's got lots of choice. So look at the history, look at the structure, look at the cost, um, and then you can make up your mind. One thing worth bearing in mind, of course, is uh, with funds, they're not always, uh, let's say, that illiquid to trade immediately. They may take some time, and in fine occasion, you'll find in certain areas, but uh, property, they even freeze up altogether. Um, but uh, so liquidity can be quite important if you need to get your hands on something, or you just want to get out of it quickly. That's mm. where an ETF or the tracker of indices will provide you a, a better structure there to trade out of it quickly. But you haven't got the the experience or the knowledge of the professional manager in that is just a, a dumb index. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan personally of dumb indexes. They they have a tendency to do better than the smart, um, clever fund pickers, I, I find, <laughs> stock pickers. Um, and I've got another question here from Pete, who says that um, gold has risen in sterling um, terms, but uh, has dropped significantly in dollar terms. Still worth buying, in my uh, in my opinion. Gold bullion coins are tax free, and that connects up with um, what Regina has asked, which is: Do we need to pay tax when buying and also when selling the physical gold? Is there any tax benefit on buying gold in physical, digital, or fund form? Um, Tim, you're you're my gold specialist. What what do you think about that? Um, if you buy physical gold in the form of sovereigns or Britannias, there's no capital gains tax to pay um, because they're, they're, they're money, they're, they're legal tender. You'd be mad to use it as legal tender because the 
their purchasing power is vastly understated on the face value of the coinage. But yeah, you don't have to pay CGT. It may be different in the silver market, but in gold, yeah, the the, the sovereigns of Britannia are come come free of tax. But all the rest of it, you have to pay tax on. That's my understanding. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, and um, Nick, when it comes to um, buying and selling um, gold and the uh, in, in its in various forms and, and commodities. Um, Again, I mean, we're, we were just talking about um, various different types of funds that you could you could um, invest in. Um, do you think that it's it's worth looking internationally, um, or should we keep to just UK funds? Yeah, the Bullion Vault provides international storage in I think Zurich, Singapore, London, and I've forgotten. Uh, Tim, you might know the the other one, but anyway, I think they offer Toronto as well. Canada, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. So you know, they're you know, directing their marketing at a, a certain crowd who wants to keep their gold offshore. The, the problem with gold and lots of other investments, actually, for UK investors and investors anywhere in the world except the US, is that the gold price is only half the equation. You've got to get the currency right, too, which is what one of the, the other questions was about. And the gold price in sterling terms has done really well. The gold price in US dollar terms. Has not, and and the reason that the that the gold price has done well in sterling terms is not because the gold price has gone up, but because the pound has gone down so much. So you've got to be aware of it. So that there's four different quadrants I call them. You've got to think about what sort of economic environment makes the gold price go up and down, and what sort of economic environment makes the pound go up and down. And you've got to figure out between the four what's going on. I think that it's an added reason for UK investors to buy gold. Because during a financial crisis, the pound is likely to crash and the gold price is likely to go up, which means you double up those gains. Uh, and you know, then if, if the, the pound and the gold price are moving in opposite directions, they sort of cancel each other out, which is basically what's happening now. And I think it's extremely unlikely that the gold price will fall and the, and the, and the pound will go up, uh, which would be the, the, the nightmare scenario for, for gold investors in the UK. Interesting point there, yes. Um, now, Andrew has said, uh, where does the panel think that inflation will be at in 12 months? I think about 20 to 25%. Interesting one. Sam, where do you think uh, inflation will be uh, in 12 months time? Will it be better than it is at the moment or will it be considerably worse, do you think? The, the opposite of what the Bank of England think would yeah. be my answer. <laughs> I think that's a very good point. Yes. Yeah. I, do, do you know, look, I mean, we, I think a lot of people have given central banks a hard time in 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 recent times, and and some of that is definitely deserved. Yeah. Um, obviously, there it's been a hard job as well. Let's not forget, you know, there's been some black swan events that haven't helped. But I think inflation next year is is going to be significantly higher. You know, you've seen some, you know, Goldman Sachs have come out not long ago, Morgan Stanley as well about UK inflation. Yeah, getting to that sort of 20% mark. You'd like to think that um, things can get a little bit better and we can we can try and sort of curb that. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's likely to increase. It's likely to be a very tough year next year for the UK. We're already expecting, obviously, this, this recession to last quite some time. Growth not to go positive for a couple of years, I've read as well. So yeah, I, I I think it's it's going to be it's going to be significantly higher than than where it is now. Um, but hopefully, once we do re sort of reach that peak, we can come down quite dramatically. But yeah, I'm not not too hopeful. Nick, you look at things from an international perspective, and I know you've got a writer um, at South Bank who lives in Argentina, where they have about sort of eighty percent, eight to zero, eighty percent inflation. Same with Turkey, of course, they've got about eighty percent. So there's there's a, a a lot of possibilities frankly what how do you see um inflation in britain and also in in other countries uh <laughs> i think there's two reasons i would expect inflation to come down in fact i would say in a year's time we'll have deflation and that's because i think there's going to be some sort of financial crisis i think the central bankers will tighten too much too fast mm -hmm. and cause some sort of crash somewhere we've already seen that uh, or at least signs of that in the uk at the moment uh, and if we do get that, I think inflation will come back down. The other reason is that inflation is a rate of increase. It's not just high prices, which means if prices double tomorrow and then stay flat, they remain too high. But the inflation rate actually cancels out to zero because they stop going up. And I think we're very much facing a situation where the, the price of things has shot up, but there's no inherent, not necessarily any inherent momentum from here on in for that to continue. 
The big caveat is the energy crisis, but um, I don't know if that inflation would show up in, in a year's time. Um, it might mean very high inflation in the next few months. Um, I'm also worried that the, the, the European solution, solutions to the energy crisis are gonna make inflation a lot worse. But um, I, I think the Eurozone is the one to watch internationally, unless there's some sort of massive currency crisis in Japan, which would be comparable to what's happened in the UK over the last week and a half. Interesting. Gosh, um, Justin, what, what do you think? Do you think um, deflation is potentially on the cards as well? Well, we can see from the commodity futures prices for next year, the commodities, uh, those prices will be dropping. Um, remember, of course, inflation adjusts uh, every month. As 12 months ago, that figure drops off. We now have another month. So it's, uh, you know, it has, uh, will oil or whatever commodities double again? Um, if it doesn't, it's just flat. Then, of course, then it looks as though it's going to be flat. And therefore, you won't see inflation going at the same level. The problem that politicians have is you move from the initial inflation and then it gets embedded and you find it embedded in things like pay rises. And you can quite understand people saying, why am I getting a 2% pay rise when inflation is going to be 10, 15 or even as uh, Goldman Sachs says, potentially over 20%. Mm -hmm. The answer is you have to separate out the, the, the issues of a short term inflation with actually uh, your pay levels in the longer term. But that's a political and corporate issues to try and manage, but not easy to try and get through. So people have to be really rather, rather careful with that. The, um, uh, to try and manage, then make sure you can manage inflation. Obviously, you've got things such as uh, index linked uh, bonds, which you can actually get some benefit that way. But they've already moved a long time ago. So it's a bit late for that, I'm afraid. I'm and budget. of course, unfortunately, the government, uh, who, of course, uh, have an awful lot of debt um, and uh, a lot of that debt, uh, as that was uh, actually as introduced by Mr. G. Brown Esquire, put into inflation linked bonds. So for years, actually it was very low. Now it's incredibly expensive. So we're paying on our uh, on our uh, amount of debt that we have. Uh, well, normally it was about two years ago, it was about 50 billion a year, which is around about the defense budget. This coming year, it's going to be about 100 billion, which is the equivalent to the entire education budget. Yeah. Um, and that's when markets start looking at us and saying, you've got too much debt here and it's costing too much. Therefore, mm. we go elsewhere. We need someone now who's just going to start rebuilding that confidence with mm. sound economic measures. And mm. sound economic measures do not include necessarily funding uh, tax breaks by taking on more debt. That doesn't make sense. And that's why the market reacted. Tim, what do you think? About what in particular? Um, sorry, <laughs> the the original question was um, where where is inflation going to be in twelve months' time? I think my answer is going to be similar to Sam's. It's going to be high, higher than is reported by the authorities. Yeah. Yes. Well, it is right now, isn't it? I've been saying for, for months, it's not nine percent, ten percent. It's fifteen. Come on, you know, it, it just. One's own lived experience changes that. I've got another interesting question here from Neil, um, where the Dragon portfolio looks to future proof one's investments for the long term. How else would the panel look to construct their doomsday portfolio aside PGLD and PSLV? Now, oh, from PGLG and this is, I think that's a reference to physical gold and physical silver. Okay, that's good because I was thinking, oh, what's that? That's clever. <laughs> what do you think, Tim? Well, this sorry, is sorry we... can I just 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 before uh, Tim answers, I, yeah. I've got to I've got to head off now. But um, it's been a pleasure to to be on, Nick, Justin, Tim. Great to get your insights, and, and Jasmine, thank you very much for for having me on as well. Lovely to have you, Sam. Thanks for take, take thanks care, for everyone. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Take care. Tim, what do you think? So yeah, so this is how we invest already. So if, if I were to, to boil it down to three things, it would be value stocks, trend following funds, which is a type of price momentum approach, and let's call it gold or real assets, cheap stocks, uh, trend following and uh, real assets. That's how we do it. And, and no bonds or cash. Oh, interesting. What, what do you think, um, Nick? What, what's your view on that? Uh, I think I would add cash. I would have some cash in that, uh, in that list. Um, I think bonds might be worth buying at the moment. Um, that, that bond crash that happened in the UK market, if you bought during that crash, you'd be sitting pretty now. Um, but yeah, for, for anything medium or longer term, um, I agree with, uh, with Tim's setup. Um, the, the challenge is finding those value investments and, and that's what Tim does. Mm. Um, interesting point here um, from Sarah, who says, isn't Russia, uh, you mean the rubles, aren't the rubles backed by gold? So they could flood the market. Is this a risk? I tell you, if I could buy rubles right now, I would. I think that, that's one of the strongest. Thank you. 
round. Bye. <laughs> <Venice>. Bye. <laughs> so, Bye. Um, Justin, what do you think? Do you think it is a risk um, that, that rubles could, could flood the market? Uh, the ru ruble is backed by hot air, um, uh, so be extremely careful indeed. This is not a proper tradable currency. Um, and bear in mind, of course, actually, remember, the Russian economy is tiny. Um, Russia is not a superpower. Russia is a dangerous power. Uh, if you look at its GDP, it's round about, well, the U it's about half the UK's GDP, uh, mm -hmm. slightly more than that. So if you think uh, we, every time we suck through our teeth, every time we fire a missile, I'll think that's another 200,000, we can't afford it. Well, they're fighting a war, which they can't afford either. Uh, they're obviously trying to make sure they try and sell their gas and oil wherever they can, but it's going to be increasingly difficult. So yes, it is uh, increasingly dependent upon gold and such like, but remember overall, but what Putin said he was going to do was broaden out the Russian economy away from commodities. He's done diametrically the opposite. Those uh, issues now of uh, the sanctions are having an, Im uh, an impact straight through there because there is this very distinct cash shortage. Yes, he had been building up cash, but a lot of it was outside Russia in banks, which are now frozen. Um, there will be other areas he can try and deal with. Uh, so no, I wouldn't be dealing with that. I wouldn't trust the ruble files like a thread. Ah, oh, Nick, do you trust the ruble? Because I like the look of it. Well, it's the best performing currency out there um, for the year to date. So while everything has crashed as soon as Joe Biden said we're going to make the ruble rubble or whatever he said uh, along those lines, since then it's performed incredibly well. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's worth speculating on after it's gone up. Uh, I can't think it's 27% a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, year to date. Uh, while everything else has crashed. Um, I think you know that game's up. That you, we've missed missed that boat. Even if you could have bought them, I'm not sure what you do with them after you you have bought them either. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, I've got um, a question or oh, point here. Moon, uh, can we get a recording of this, please? Yes, you can. We, I'm recording it now, and I will be uploading it to Money Magpie. In fact, um, Izzy will be doing it hopefully sort of later today or tomorrow. So we'll put it in the newsletter as as soon as we have it as well. Um, interesting point here. Now, annoyingly, Sam has just gone. He, he would have been the perfect person to answer this, Peter. Um, can you comment on Bitcoin and the security issues with storage? Where to buy it? Uh, very good, very good point. I mean, you know, the one that I tend to mention is Coinbase, but there have been issues with Coinbase. Ultimately, uh, when it comes to storage of, of any cryptocurrency, they, they, probably the best is to do what they call cold storage, which is basically a sort of a USB stick type of thing. So you can you buy it maybe on Coinbase or Bitfinex, one of those, and then you transfer it to your cold storage uh, USB stick, and then you store that somewhere very safe. So I, I would say um, that's the best. But when it comes to commenting on Bitcoin, um, I know, Nick, you're not a huge fan, um, I, I believe. What, what What's your view? Uh I think it's lost its soul. So I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. I'm uh, uh, disappointed in the fact that it's become a speculative mania. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bitcoin has an intrinsic value because it's a payment network, not just mm -hmm. a money, which means you can transfer Bitcoin all over the world um, to anyone anonymously and all these other benefits. That has value. The ability to do that has value. I've moved internationally twice in the last two years. Um, I know the, the value of being able to move money without having to mess about with a bank and tax and all of these authorities and, uh, and, and the complexity of it. Um, and, and that part of Bitcoin has been completely lost in all of the speculative mania um, that's grown up around Bitcoin. So I, I wish people would focus on the power that it has to change lives and economies rather than uh, big, yeah, being a speculative asset. That said, the value of Bitcoin is proven at times like this when you know all of these um, the, these financial systems are struggling and you've got sanctions on Russia and things like that. Imagine you have a family member in Russia and you need to get the money or you had a business that was you know, operating in, in Russia partially. Well, Bitcoin offers solutions to people like that. Argentina is, is the best example and, and parts of Africa. That's been lost um, and people just care about the price now, which is at that point, it becomes a, a Ponzi scheme, a speculative mania um, and the criticism is justified. Yeah, and, and I, I am surprised, rather like gold, that Bitcoin isn't higher at the moment for all of those very reasons, as, as you say. It, it, it should be actually worth more, but it seems to have gone up and down with the stock market, which is frankly weird. But, but while I say weird, I suppose it is, as you say, because of speculators. They speculate in the stock market and at the same time they speculate in Bitcoin. 
Yeah, if you remember years ago, Airbnb and Uber, they used to be very libertarian, anti-government, challenging the establishment companies. And then that's how they became big and how they became successful. And then slowly over time, they became more and more pro-government, more and more establishment, more lobbyists. And they became part of the city councils that tried to ban them and you know, partnered with taxi firms and airports and all this sort of thing. They lost their entire soul and, and the whole purpose of being. And, and they got subsumed into this, this the, the establishment effectively. Um, and, and I think it's the same with Bitcoin. It's become part of financial markets, at least the price has. And how most people buy and invest in Bitcoin now is, is through exchanges, which defeats the whole purpose of doing it in the first place. That's a good point. It's like PayPal, um, which which originally was was you know the new and exciting um, player in the market, and now they're cancelling people because they don't like their views. It's it's quite appalling. Oh, um, got some good points here. Andrew Bevan says um, twenty percent VAT on silver. Peter Miller says also twenty percent VAT on platinum coins as well. Useful to know. Thank you very much um, to know about because yeah, it, it all costs. Um, now, Raj has said, uh, interesting, any um, any advice on buying alternative assets like Rolexes, fine art, wine, etc. We're quite good on that on moneymagpie.com, actually. So do have a look at our articles. But Justin, what do you think about what sort of general advice do you have about these alternative, quite, quite fun investments? Well, that's it. They're fun. Um, but uh, bear in mind, these are normally unregulated investments. So you have to be even more aware of what's going on. Uh, now, given my, my own personal background, I actually do in, invest in some wine, mainly because I happen to know, know certain wines and know how they trade. And to that extent, actually, that's been really rather good. But for the innocent entering that market, it's a very good way of getting thoroughly ripped off, yeah. depending who you're dealing with. Um, and it's a market which, well, it may say it's liquid because it's wine, but not always liquid enough to necessarily trade in the time you want it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are other alternative assets which uh, are, you know, again, probably pretty liquid for quite good value. I have uh, a couple of old cars which are done re really rather well, but I'll be sitting there, so trading uh, a, a Morris Traveller from 1963 um, mm -hmm. because actually it's going to be really uh, quite restrictive. But in terms of an asset going up, uh, I've also got quite a lot of Roman coins. Um, but again, same thing. It's a nice asset to have. Um, I can sit back and say it's, it's going to be worth something, but it's, it is something which is not regulated. It's not easy to actually get proper price formation. Uh, so it's more of a hobby. As long as you keep it like that and you're not sitting there and your pension doesn't depend on it, uh, then that's okay. If you go, that's the area where you can actually have some fun, uh, use it and treat it as a hobby. Yes, I, I have a, an interest in, in Hermes handbags. I've written about them a few times. They've gone good. Up phenomenally. It's mm. just that, yes, what stops me is thinking, all right, I've got to do some little bit of research in this. I'll, I'll have to go to some auctions, et cetera, and have a look at them. And you, you do, you need to sp take a bit of time on it. Tim, is there anything that you collect uh, other than compliments, obviously? Uh, battle scars. <laughs> yes. What about battleships, though, and and, and um, toy planes? I mean, you you're pretty good on those. I I seem to remember. No, di dig digitally only. So I'd, I'd put in a oh. plug for a game called War Thunder, which which tidied me over during the first lockdown. But uh, I don't think there's anything collectible about it. How about you, Nick? Do you collect anything? I have bought some wine futures, which means you, you buy the wine before it's bottled. Uh, maybe I'll try and sell them to Justin uh, shortly after this uh, this video. <laughs> That's a good idea. Well, that's all we've got time for. I'm really sorry because we've got some more questions. Feel free, by the way, with questions that haven't been answered, send them in to us. Send them to editorial at moneymagpie.com and we will get them answered. So that's editorial at moneymagpie.com. We'll get some great people to answer any of your questions. So send them in. Thank you to, to Sam, who's not here. Sam North from um, eToro. Thank you to eToro for sponsoring. Thank you so much, Nick Hubble, for coming all the way from Australia. I'll have to get back in the plane now and go back um, to <laughs> get to bed. Um, thank you so much, Justin uh, urquhart Stewart. And what's your cat called? What's the lovely this is, this is Betty Boo. Betty Boo, lovely Betty Boo. Thank you. And thank you, Tim Price, man of mystery. One day we'll see his face. One day. Oh, yes, we will. Thank you so much for all those 
wonderful piece of advice and thank you audience members thank you so much for coming along and bringing your fantastic questions it's been great to see you come along to the next one make sure that you're signed up to eventbrite follow us on eventbrite follow us on money magpie S sign up to the money magpie investing newsletter it comes out once a fortnight full of useful stuff and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one bye bye <laughs>